and I, I said this on the Joe Rogan podcast, being a special operations is not necessarily the most dangerous job in the world. Being in the regular army, having no context, like you're a cook, you're told to get on a 50 cal, you're told to go, out, go down route Irish by yourself in a convoy, you join the army to cook. When you join special operations, you're volunteering and you know exactly what you're getting into. That's what ultimately, actually statistically, makes it less dangerous. I've been debated on this even by members from my own community. It's like, it's not debatable. Hey guys, welcome back to Prep Life. Today we're talking about this little guy here. Yep, congratulations. Not to me, to you for hooking me up. If it wasn't for you guys' support, offering me the ability to do this job at Philcraft Survival, which I thoroughly enjoy. I wouldn't be able to write a book like this called Prepared, a manual for surviving worst case scenarios. Now, there's a lot of things going on in the news right now, and some of it important. I'll talk about that in the latter show later in the week. Um, but I wanted to talk about a specific story breaking out about preparedness that might help you get a sense of how this book is written and how it will benefit you in all things preparedness. Also, I want to say big shout out to all my patrons at Patreon. If it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be able to do this content. And if you guys want to see the Patreon underground show where I just let loose, also we'll be talking about some of the underground aspects of this gun battle that I was in. You guys can check it out at patreon.com forward slash Mike Glover. All right, that link's down below as well. So first copies, I just opened this up. I should have did like a boxing un like reveal. It was anticlimactic. I actually filmed it and filmed it backwards. Like I tried to put it on myself and then it just didn't work out. And then the box was open and then I didn't want to tape it back. It, I didn't want to do that. So I got these and these are the first copies. I got 12 of these copies. I actually got a Signed copy right, waiting for Jocko. Uh, I'll be flying to Jocko's next week. Uh, I'm going to do some content with him, hopefully for our application, the Philcraft Survival app, launching the same day this book is dropping. To open this book and to see like the words on the page is a really cool experience, guys. I, like, I don't know. I guess you could do this at Kinko's. You can go down the road and get this produced and made. Uh, one of the most impactful things for me personally, um, outside of Jack Carr riding the Ford, and then having Ray Porter, the voice of Terminalist, say the audible version of that, which sounds a lot cooler than Jack Carr. I love you, Jack. Um, the most important part of this book is the first page of it, where I say, for my son Benjamin and my daughter Penelope, and hopes that your dad gave you all the tools needed to thrive. Um, I wrote that because when I wrote this book, I was thinking about them, the future of our country. And I often tell people kind of jokingly, but I, I really mean it, if you want to make profound impact on the world and change in the world for the future, keep your family together, have lots of babies, and raise good humans. That's how you live your prepared life. That's actually how you do it. You, you don't outsource them in education and everything and let them do whatever the hell they want because they want to be a unicorn or whatever. You actually insulate them, you tell them, you teach them, you, you develop them to be good human beings, and that's how we change the world. I, I know it sounds like so philanthropic and woo-woo and utopian, but that's literally something you could do from the ground up. So for you babies, I love you guys. So one of the stories that I picked out of this book prepared had to do with a war experience that I had in Solder City. And it, it kind of was the business plan for Phil Craft Survival from the onset, where I said to myself, like, this idea or concept of survival or preparedness, how do I turn that and evolve that into educating, training, and equipping people, citizens? So the, the, the first question, the first question that I developed for the business model was, why do special operations guys go out into hostile deliberately hostile environments and come out on top. And I, I said this on the Joe Rogan podcast, being a special operations is not necessarily the most dangerous job in the world. Being in the regular army, having no context, like you're a cook, you're told to get on a 50 cal, you're told to go, go down route Irish by yourself in a convoy, you join the army to cook, right? When you join special operations, you're volunteering, and you know exactly what you're getting into. That's what ultimately, 
actually statistically makes it less dangerous. I've been debated on this even by members from my own community. It's like, it's not debatable. Most certainly it's more dangerous in being a, in a line unit in the Marine Corps in the Battle of Fallujah than it is being a member of special operations. The statistics prove that. So the reason that is, is because of many things. It's culture, attention to detail, planning, working out the lifestyle of preparedness. It's not a hobby. It's not like I hit the range on the weekend. I do the tactical combat casualty care. Uh, I get certified. I do the EMT course basic, and then I live my best life. You're living your best life if you're living a prepared life. So in this story, um, it was Sauter City, and everybody knows Sauter City. You, you hear it in the war movies. You hear it talked about uh, veterans like myself. And it, Sauter City was a shithole. I mean, let's be honest. It was like the bottom of the barrel. Mahdi Army and its militia operated on the Shia side in a vacuum. Saddam Hussein had actually suppressed Shias into this, we called it a baseball diamond. We actually talked about it um, as a square, but it was, it was shaped as a diamond going from south to north. And this diamond was blocked off from the rest of the country, really, because he wanted to isolate who he didn't like, Shias. I mean, there was a whole bunch of reasons for that, even leading back to the Iran and Iraq war. So Mokhtar Sadr and Sadr's militias, the Mahdi army, were heavily active in the years that I was in Iraq, in my several rotations, five rotations to Iraq. This particular trip, I was doing um, support for an operation where the assault force was going in the middle of Sadr City towards, uh, if you're familiar, some of you guys are veterans who listen to me, and some of you guys have been in Sadr City. But um, it was near home base. We were conducting a hostage rescue of Iraqi hostages being held by the Mahdi militia. As per, is something that we often did, we did this at night. And we did this um, surreptitiously. But in Sadr City at this time period, everybody knew when you went through the gates, which were HESCO barriers surrounding the wall, that you were going to be in harm's way. In fact, here's a little... Actually, I'll save that for um, Patreon's Underground. I apologize. I should have even done that. But it has to do with Chris Kyle and his sniper mission that relates to this Sauter City story. I'll tell you guys about it in the Underground. Um, but when we set this up, no matter what, as soon as you penetrated the walls, you were compromised. The element of surprise didn't exist because everybody knew you were there. There were base stations. There were relay stations. There were early early warning networks to establish where you were and where you were going. So often during this time period, at the time, Sauter City was a free fire zone. Free fire zone. So our rules of engagement actually dictated that we can kill any fighting age male that was out and about because likely they were out and about because they were militants. And we, there was obviously a curfew. It was announced to the Iraqi government. And it, it was just a hostile place. We actually used tanks and Bradleys to penetrate the walls of Sadr City to get access, it, access to it with the assault force. At the time, I was a member of 3rd Special Forces Group CRIF, or Commanders and Extremist Force. And we were going through this uh, wall, and we went to set up containment on the outskirts of the cordon, right? We were the outer cordon. As the assault force made breach, me and another teammate, we were both snipers on the same te team named Chris, we established a presence on top of a third-story building that were behind the tanks and Bradleys that we were acting as assault force liaisons so that we could communicate to the inner cordon or to the containment element where the assault force was located, our own guys, if there were bad guys potentially heading their way or bad guys heading out of the AO. Now, Mahdi Army's tactics at the time were to basically QRF their own. So there would be vehicles running from all over Sauter City trying to respond and react to reinforce the bad guys that we were going after. This went down like clockwork, 
And as expected, it started to get bad. So it started with small arms fire. Now, remember, I'm on a third-story roof. We actually had a, a 4th Infantry Division regular Army sniper team co-located with us, and we were there to report information. I didn't even have a long gun. I mean, the op, uh, as, as presented, I wasn't even supposed to be on the ground. I was actually supposed to be in a Bradley while we were in containment and not outside the vehicle, but things change in war. I didn't plan for the contingency of bagging out a sniper rifle. In fact, when we were told that there would be tanks and Bradleys, they have superior weapon systems that have superior optics to reach out even thermal image bad guys at night, except Murphy's Law dictates that nothing goes as planned, and it certainly didn't. The gunfight started, and it rolled late into the night into the early morning. By time we started making contact with the enemy, it was daylight. And it's not good to be exposed in Sauter City during daylight. You will get killed. And it happened often to regular army guys stationed outside of Sauter City and Firebase Hope um, and also from Special Operations where three Navy SEALs from, I believe, Jocko's platoon uh, or at least his sister platoon were killed in an EFP prior to us arriving. We ripped out with Jocko's element. So we're on the ground, or we're on the, the rooftop of this third-story building, and we take small arms fire, snaps and cracks overhead. And we're thinking, well, we're at a third-story building. They're down below. The angles aren't appropriate. They can't get access to us, and we're pretty safe. And we weren't safe, not even close. At one point during the gunfight, I remember looking over at Chris who had his head buried in the concrete on top of the roof, and there was a satellite dish disintegrating off of his ass. And in true Chris fashion, he's one of the best number one mans I've ever had in my life. He's somebody who mentored me on the assault side in the CRIF. He just looked at me and smiled as that satellite dish was disintegrating off his ass. I was actually hiding behind the doghouse, which is the basically the access wall uh, for the stairs leading up from the third floor on top of the roof. I had an RTO with me that was dedicated to me and Chris's position and also the tanks and brads, and we had a regular Army sniper team. At one time, because we were on the border or edge of Sauter City, I looked back, and one of the young machine gunners, first combat rotation, first combat mission in Iraq, and he's on a saw gun, and he turns back, and he's like, Sergeant, I was at E7 at the time. He said, I got a guy running up on the backside of us. I'm like, what's he wearing? What's he got? AK-47, black pajamas, which is classic Monty Army. Okay, what are you doing? He's like, what do you want me to do? I'm like, light him up. Like, shoot him. And I remember him lighting that guy up on the back end, and I thought to myself, wait a minute, like, the enemy's downrange this way. There's fields in the in behind us. How the hell are there bad guys coming up behind us? There were bad guys who lived outside of Sauter City that were getting the call and were doing everything they could to basically respond and react and QRF their friends. And that was that was what was happening. As the force increased, um, it went from small arms to RPG. I have never been on the back end at that time in my career of an RPG. I mean, I've been shot at with RPGs, but I've never been that close to the impact of RPGs. And I remember looking up and seeing air bursts of like explosions and plumes of smoke. And I didn't understand what the hell it was. And I remember yelling at Chris like, dude, what's going on? He's like, those are air bursts from RPGs. Like the RPGs, RPGs expending its max ord or ordinance and exploding. And I'm like, oh my God, like this is not good. Then we started seeing, which was one of the most scary moments in my career, mortar impacts land around us. They were bracketing our position. So they were also engaging uh, because all of the tanks and Bradleys were shooting uh, all of their weapon systems, including, I believe it's the 105 millimeter um, main gun on a, on a tank. If I'm incorrect, I'm not a tanker, I apologize. Team Rock, which is the task force we were working with that were tanks and Bradleys, 
or or if you know former uh, tanker veterans, please let me know in the comments down below. But they were going and and launching and lobbing uh, rounds at bad guys at will. When I started seeing the impact of the mortar rounds, we started becoming very fearful because we were in a very bad position because we were supporting the assault force with overwatch and basically a forward observation position. Without that position, we couldn't communicate to the tanks and brads and to the assault force all the things that we were seeing from our third story building. So we had to hold our position. As this evolved, we saw the bracketing and the impact of the mortar rounds landing in the field. And I actually remember and thinking to myself, I might die. I might die on this op. Uh, this might be the op that we get killed. Uh, one of our young snipers from 4th ID who had a uh, M24 SWS. I'll go into detail that in the underground, but it's a, basically a sniper weapon system. Was engaging bad guys, and we were doing our best to engage bad guys. Um, at one point... We realized that we needed to get down and break contact, but we were in the middle of a very high-intensity, high-volume gunfight. That's when the F-16 came in. So we had a fast mover overhead. We had a combat controller on the ground. I had not yet been to JTAC school. I didn't understand much about aircraft except for my several rotations at that point, including Afghanistan, on how this whole ordinance thing worked. But what I recognized immediately was our communications to the aircraft and to the combat controller at the assault force we could not reach. And that was bad. Because we saw the F-16 start to break out of loiter, and we heard traffic that the F-16 identified potential enemy combatants on a rooftop near the cordon position. And I, fig I found out later that he wasn't talking about us but I immediately thought he identified us from a pod in his cockpit that we're the bad guys and he's about to do a gun run. In fact, he broke out of his orbit and went to do what I thought was an attack run on his gun target line, basically getting lined up with machine guns to be able to go, come in hot and either drop a pill on top of us or do a machine gun run and bail out. So he started to come down. And immediately I knew that we were in harm's way. I pulled a VS-17 out of my kit, um, which is a big fluorescent panel. I actually had the larger one that we kept in vehicles in my kit. And we opened it up. I opened it up on the middle of that rooftop. He came down and as we all like literally held our heads because we thought we were going to take impact from somewhere, he went down the target road that we were on and strafed the tanks and Bradleys and popped flares. He likely wasn't low, but it felt like he was a couple feet above the ground. He was so close. I mean, we heard him coming down. He, we looked up, and then he launched up into the air. What he was doing was a force protection measure in lulling the gunfight as requested by the combat controller, which I found out about later in the conversation. I'll talk, I'll talk to you guys about that in the underground, too, because it was a, a conversation that I was like, oh, my God, like, Thank God. I got chills right now just talking about it out loud. That lulled the campaign. We were able to break contact and get in the tanks of Brad's. We killed over 100 enemy combatants. We got shut down for 30 days from operating in Sodder City because it became this huge event. Um, it was a very intense battle, but it wasn't the only intense battle that I've been in in my military career. But what I realized in the individual decision-making of guys that I was with, even the regular army guys that I was with, that if it wasn't for everybody's combined efforts with a prepared mindset, we wouldn't have survived. And I think that's what it is. I think when I wrote this book, I looked at a reflection of like, how do these people survive? How do you land on top of an enemy safe house full of enemy combatants and come out on top? Well, you do so prepared as a lifestyle. You live it, and then you're statistically more probable of surviving. So that's ultimately what I wanted to share uh, with you. I also want to talk to you about a couple things. Um, I did a, a bunch of light content recently with Everyday Carry and handhelds, and I got a lot of good input. You know, we talked about, like, hey, what's your, your favorite handheld? Do you attach 
uh, lights to guns? How does it work for you? I am I specifically do not attach lights to guns. There's a couple reasons for that. One, um, I mean, depending on what I'm carrying, this is a Glock 17 full size pistol in our Philcraft Survival magnet retention holster, which retains it with a magnet. So there's retention. But when I have this pistol, I don't have the ability to put a light on it because we don't make it for the light because there's universally too many options. I also like the utility of lights, um, like in a headlamp. I, I overland a lot. I, I would like more likely use this light to check under the hood than I would illuminate a bad guy. So I like to use them separate. I'm that guy. So I prefer handhelds. In fact, we made a special edition light with cloud defensive in this VS-17, as described for my story, orange, uh, anodized, because this is the perfect light for me. I mean, it's I, we like it. We tested it. We looked at it, and it's made in America, which is pretty important to me. Um, what's your favorite light? Make sure you leave the comments down below. We're interested to hear your input because we might get into lights. It's something that we're entertaining. Uh, in fact, some of the education we just did recently included low light, no light considerations for the Philcraft Survival app. Also, last but not least, let me talk about this shirt. Vertex just dropped this shirt. Look, guys, I'm a small business. We have 20 full-time employees and a couple dozen uh, subcontractors across the country. Small business. If I was to make this shirt in-house, which we tried to do, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's taxing. I wanted to make it, and luckily, Vertex is a good enough company. They came to us and said, hey, do you want to do a collaboration? I said, certainly I do. So I made this shirt. This is the original Recce shirt. It's a shirt that was worn by Jack Carr in uh, the Terminal List series when he got all shot up. It's also a shirt that I designed from my GRS experience and global response staff working with the CIA. The reason I did this shirt is because there's a lot of things that I liked about collared shirts, especially in presentation, like, hey, it shows you're professional and whatever. But there's things that I didn't like about certain fits and certain styles of shirt. So I wanted a little bit more utility, like zippable pockets inside the uh, the uh, sleeve, long sleeve and short sleeve, concealable um, pocket inside of the back of the collar. I like that. Buttons that look like the pill throughs, but they're actually buttons so you could snap release to access your pistol. A certain length cut. So it's perfect for everyday carry. It's not too high. It's not too low. It's just about right. It's like an untucked fit. And last but not least, the material that Vertex put into it, which is water resistant. I like everything about it, and it's available right now in the link down below at Vertex.com. Guys, I appreciate you guys. I'm going to focus more in, in a, a – I can't – words are hard when you're talking about your, your prep life. I'm going to focus my attention on the underground, giving you the best value, and I will tell you if you have children – if you have, you know, it's not, it's it's uncensored. We are not censoring that show that's available at my Patreon. So just know as a warning, because I did get a couple complaints, like, dude, you're dropping more F-bombs than I've ever heard you. It's like, that's how I actually talk in real life. When I'm trying to be professional, I don't drop the F-bomb, but sometimes I just want to be me. And that's what that show is all about. Uh, I appreciate you guys. June 6th, prepared. Also our app on Philcraft Survival. Appreciate you. We'll see you next time. Peace out. <laughs>